Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And we have another uh, another European guest uh, this evening. We have someone from the UK, and his name is Jason Gleaves, and uh, he's been researching UFO photos and videos and things, and we're going to be talking about that and his background. Uh, should be a good show. Alejandro Rojas cannot make it. I think he said he's in Las Vegas. He's interviewing. Uh, he's interviewing an astronaut. So he said. Um, he said he had a full schedule today. Just couldn't make it. So, hey. So in that case, um, I'm going to say if, if anyone's a live listener and they just want to call in and talk about a sighting, um, you're welcome to do that. And uh, we're going to put the number up on the screen. Um, I'll give that number out. Um, just I should have been prepared, but I don't have it up there right now. So that number is 603-967-4030 if you'd like to call in and talk about a sighting. If not, um, I have a couple of sightings that I want to talk about on my uh, podcastufo.com page. Uh, We have a sightings page, and it's anonymous. Um, I'll get back to that, but I do want to thank everyone that does support the show. I really appreciate that. Anyone can do that. Um, You just have to find uh, the menu bar on podcastufo.com, support the show. And you can go there. Um, if you can't support the show, you want to listen for free, you can show up on podcastufo.com every Wednesday evening at 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or you can also listen over at the Dark Matter Digital Network. And that is on Thursdays as a pre-recorded show. And that is, uh, that is 10 to midnight. Also, you can watch live on YouTube. Our shows are first uh, recorded live on YouTube and then made into an audio podcast. That's how that goes. Again, I want to thank everyone that uh, supports the show. And uh, if anyone wants to call in, you're listening live, uh, talk about a sighting, um, you can call now. 603-967-4030 is the number. Um, So on Podcast UFO, before I invite our guests, I just wanted to talk about, I have this page called the UFO Sightings page. And I also have an anonymous form that uh, anyone can fill out. Um, You don't have to remain anonymous, but you have that option. So um, anyway, it's getting pretty active. Uh, We're having a number of sightings, and we have a great video that just came up. Uh, That's in uh, Everett, Washington, happened back in uh, mid-March. And uh, check the video out if you go to our website, um, it's really, really interesting. Can't quite figure out what that is. Uh, we also have um, a sighting up. Oh, someone's calling in. They did call in, and it looks like they hung up. Try again. <laughs> that number's on the screen now, so you can see that number on the screen. Uh, I don't know if you hung up or you got cut off, but do try calling back. So we also have uh, a sighting someone posted, and uh, that it's Strange Lights in Victoria. In Australia and there's a picture there also it's a great looking really weird looking picture and check that out um, we have rectangle UFOs and then we have a person talking about his grandfather's in- encounter um, he was part of the 509th uh, bomb group in Wa- Roswell um, that's not when he's had the the sighting but he was just making a note that he was also we have a uh, Ontario Canada sighting and uh, a lot of great ones, so I hope you check that out. It's, again, it's on podcastufo.com, and you're welcome to post your sightings there. Well, if the caller doesn't try to call me back, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest. So I'll give you a couple seconds here. Um, that is really all I can think of to talk about. It's been kind of a slow week. I was on uh, Alejandro's show the other day, and we were talking about um, you know, sightings lately and not too much going on. So I don't even know what he would talk about, actually, to be honest with you, if he came on the show. So anyway, we are ready to uh, bring on our guest. Um, he actually was in, as they say, in England. He was in the military. Um, he was in the Royal Air Force in 1986. He went in at 17 years of age. Um, he had a sighting too young. We're going to talk about that. Welcome to the show, Jason. Can you hear me, Jason? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I forgot to I'm unmute. Right? Hi, welcome to the show. And it's uh, like one o'clock in the morning for you. So thank you so much for uh, for staying awake. Yeah, that's and, okay. Thank you for inviting me on. Sure. 
And your book, uh, what inspired you to write your, your book? Is this uh, all about the research you've been doing lately? Yeah, basically, it was sort of um, the next step after I, I, I brought out UFO pages on Facebook and Twitter and all different media. Um, and it was just really the natural progression onwards to, to bring out a book, really, of the analysis that I do on different photographs. So a lot of your work was started on Facebook. You have a Facebook page. Um, and it's basically called what you call everything else. And what's that called again? UFO what? UF only. It's um, it's basically on all the different formats. Um, and I really went on to Facebook because you can reach more people that way. Amazing, isn't it? And uh, yep. I, our page has something like 22,000 people on it. Um, not all of them are active, of course, but it's just amazing how you can reach so many people through that site. But yeah, uh, yeah. when you th think there's two billion people on there, <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> hard. Uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, mm. So what got you interested in the topic to begin with? Um, I suppose it really goes back when I was a young child um, and had a sighting with my sister uh, when I was about seven years old, which is during the 1970s. And it was in Liverpool near the, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the racetrack in Liverpool, Intry Racecourse. And um, we were basically playing as young kids do. And she sort of got my attention and said, do you see that outside the window? And we both looked and there was a silver disc shaped object outside the window. Um, we both observed it and then it took off at high velocity. And then we just seemed to carry on playing uh, as if nothing had happened. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'd actually forgotten about it. It was my sister that brought it back up only when I started getting into, you know, the page and writing different things. So um, a bit of a weird wow. one. So it was kind of subliminally there, maybe. Um, yeah. In the, in, but, you know, it's you are not the first one that has said that that I've heard a lot of people have forgotten about sightings and uh, something either triggers it. I think it was Peter Robbins had a major sighting with his sister when they were young. Also, he was with his sister and he forgotten all about it. He, he totally forgot about it until the sister brought it up. You know, yeah. so it is, uh, it's not uncommon at all. And I, I, find, I find that uh, kind of funny that someone could forget something that you know that amazing but important <laughs> yeah 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 and you've had a uh, you've had another sighting too right um yeah i've had a, a few different things that have happened um obviously but the the one that's in the book really is the um i was on the base the night at RAF Cosford which is a, a a base a royal air force base in the UK in the midlands uh, not far from birmingham wolverhampton area and it was during March 1993. Um, and my friend, he was in the, the guard room. He was in charge of the guard room that night, the orderly corporal. And um, basically, I was I did see I was on, in, in the billets at the time. And he told me about it all later. And we, we got into more depth. Um, and he said it, it was nice and quiet at night. It was late night going into the next day uh, as you expect and you want it to be when you're doing a gate guard you want it to be nice and quiet and um, he said all of a sudden the radio burst into life and there was a young trainee because RF Cosford is also a training camp where they train armourers and different trades and disciplines and he said uh, there was a young trainee on the gate guard on the airfield which is actually on the front of the book, you can see, and in the book, you the actual guard post is in there. I've taken photographs of it, and, and it's there to see for yourself. And he said um, this young lad was screaming down the radio to get the guard commander out to the base because um, there was a huge black triangular-shaped craft over the airfield, um, and then other people that did see it when they all got there, the guard commander, the RAF police and all different people 
went out there in the, in the Land Rovers, etc., got there and they all described the same thing as seeing this huge black triangular shaped craft and uh, they described it the size of a battleship which is quite huge really you're probably talking 800 feet plus um and this thing obviously uh, startled the young lad and he was quite shook up about it um and then he took off from ref cosford and then went on to another ref base which is not uh, too far away as, as the crow flies which is uh, RAF Shawbury, which is a helicopter base. It's probably uh, probably 15, 20 miles away. And the on-duty air traffic controller uh, in the evening um, saw this craft coming in over the base, and they actually got a radar lock on it. And he said um, that it was fine lasers down over the airfield and wow. his impressions were that it was trying to look for something that was that was the impression he got and then it obviously took off from there but um throughout the the, the that evening leading up to the, the sightings on the ref bases uh, it was seen throughout the uk and they were whether it was the same craft and maybe another craft we, we don't know but Similar craft were seen throughout the UK by um, on-duty policemen and civilians, and you know, quite a few people. So it's it's quite um, uh, documented. Now, now, does it have you know, like uh, for instance, there's the Bentwater Rendlesham Forest case, stuff like that. Do they does this actually have like a case name? Is it is it a cost for what was the uh... yeah. Yeah, it was um, RAF Cosford, which is Cosford. it's an actual RAF base. Yeah. Um, um, actually, the day after, um, Nick Pope came out to the base and he had dealings with it and, and the personnel and it of the afternoon investigating it himself. And he was in uh, Whitehall um, at the time on the, the British X-Files desk when he was working there. And if, um, in the book, I've actually put links there where people can go freely onto YouTube, et cetera, and see Nick talking about the case. So um, did you actually meet Nick at the time, or did you see him there, or just hear about yeah, it afterwards? Yeah, you just knew about him when puzzled and brought the whole case together. And obviously Nick had spoke about it for years. Um, yeah. You know, he's not sort of held back on it. And he actually wrote quite a big piece in the book for me at the beginning um, regarding my leading up to, you know, the, the sighting and then his piece afterwards, the way he dealt with it and et cetera. So it's quite interesting. Um, how did they uh, how did how did the MOD leave that case just as an unknown? Yeah, it's still unsolved case, um, unidentified to what the craft was. Um, I over time you, you you come up with your own conclusions and things, and I I think it probably was a secret covert black military you know um, covert project um, because a lot of sightings I'm sure through through my research and going down those avenues um a, a lot of people i think sea craft and it's unidentified because obviously ufo that's what it stands for unidentified flying objects so when when they don't know what the craft is and if it's secret covert that's not seen by most people in the general public sense um it's unidentified and i think that suits the military um the secret covert projects that People don't know what they're seeing, so it's the perfect cover story for them. But why would it shoot down lasers at the ground, though? I mean, that part doesn't make yeah. much sense. No, no, there, there are other things that could lead on to, you know, you thinking other, could it be extraterrestrial? Again, whether they know about it and they're not saying, high, you know, higher authorities, but you're going off the facts of, um, the sightings and what people saw and what was recorded on the ne on the evening. So, um, be, with it still being un unidentified, it, it still leaves the door open to being whichever, really. 
Did anyone talk about any noise coming from the craft? No. Um, the the only noise was like a humming sound. Yeah, that's the one um, you always hear about the triangles. They you hear about a humming. Yeah, yeah, and um, but no sound at all. No, as it took off at high velocity, and uh, you, you have to remember military personnel see aircraft, fighter aircraft, and military aircraft, so they know what they're looking at. They see the speeds they can fly at, and um, this thing actually took off so fast. But there was no, um, as if it was breaking through a sound barrier, so there was no boom or yeah. anything else. That's uh, that's you always hear that too. Um, even yeah. tracked on radar, going you know well, uh, you know thousands of miles an hour, no sonic yeah. boom. No, so it's, no, it's just totally baffling, isn't it? Um, and, and in the book, um, I've actually managed to get hold of the official uh, military documents, which have been released by the MOD since. Mm. So um, they're in the book, and the, the, when the investigation was been taking place through the uh, the site in itself, um, they they did actually contact a lot of other military bases throughout the UK, who have got the overall radar scope so you know Bryce Norton and RF line and all the big places that have the bigger radar patches and I'm not sure whether they actually picked it up or not but um, it, it was still unidentified because it was not one of ours. Now uh, at the Rendlesham Forest incident there was some speculation that there was possibly some nuclear warheads possibly they you can never say for sure and and uh, when I've had Charles Halt on my show, he did not want to talk about it, and I totally respect that. He can't. Uh, but um, were there any weapons on that base in particular? No. Of any, no. Of any kind? None? No. It, it's, a, it's a training camp, so like mm -hmm. I said, the, the, the actual things that they have on the camp are training aids, etc. There is a large museum there where they've got all different types of aircraft throughout RAF history, etc. Military, American, you know, all foreign mil militaries there. Um, so really, yeah, I, I don't know why personally it could have been there for any other reason other than, like you've just said, other um, craft have been seen over military installations, etc. throughout yeah. the world. So, right, yeah. Uh, another another thing uh, that always comes to mind when this was in 1993, right? Is that when you said it was? Yeah. Yeah. So 1993 and all this time goes by, um, you would think that um, there would be, uh, if it was secret military craft, you would think that that technology would be known by now. Wouldn't mm. you think that? I mean, th that's that's always kind of puzzling to me. I mean. If something yep. like that was that advanced that it could take off in that type of speed, you just think that we would know something about it by now. Yeah, you, you certainly would, yeah. Um, and, you know, people do say you know, what they've got in the secret covert cloakroom uh, cupboard is 50 years ahead of what we've actually got flying around in the military now, so... Yeah, I've heard people say 20 years. Uh, I haven't never heard 50 years, but, you know, nothing would mm. actually surprise me. But uh, it just seems, you know, I know these people are under top secret, um, you know, clearances. They can't talk. They're contracted. Um, but uh, it just seems like we would seem to know something a little mm -hmm. if, uh, if these things, especially when something can ele stay elevated um, without moving, you know, can hover and not yeah. have any, you know, propulsion of any kind that you can actually see. <laughs> yeah, you know, like anti-gravity, yeah. all that type of thing, yeah. Right, right. So let's talk about um, some of the cases that you have researched. And, and wh what made you decide to do the research that you do? Oh, really, it stemmed from my sighting, really, and things that have happened, and then obviously the Cosford thing. So uh -huh. I, I, I didn't research into it until I'd actually left the Air Force. Um, 
and it just seemed to escalate really. Um, you, the, the way, there wasn't many people out there who could actually answer my questions, so it was really roll your sleeves up and get in, and the internet was becoming better and better, a better tool to research, so mm -hmm. um, it was making it easier to find things out, and the more you found out, the more I, I'd be looking into one case, for example, and generally another five doors would open with different cases again leading off that one and it uh -huh. just it, it got worse and worse um <laughs> and i i i just put it down to uh, what do i call it the uh, richard dreyfus syndrome um <laughs> where you, you just starting to build the mountain in the house yeah, yeah you become <laughs> manic and <laughs> i wouldn't say sleepless sleepless nights but it, you do think about it an awful lot yeah yeah. Uh, yeah, it is interesting. I've heard a number of people say the same thing that, you know, one thing kind of leads into another. And a lot of times when they uh, people that have written a book, it's like after the book, they're contacted by all these people. Has that been happening? Oh, you know, it, it happened before the book, really. The book, like you said, was a progression. And I was speaking with Philip and it sort of progressed from there and um, how we would approach the book or how I would write it and um, like Philip's been a great help to me because I've never wrote a book before obviously um, and I, I really needed to I wanted to be a layman's type of book where somebody who had not really been into ufology um, where we all start at one point um, it's a bit of a DIY book where you pick it up and it gives you the basics of what to look for, how to analyze photographs, etc., cetera, um, misidentifications, um, and just basically leading you in slowly. And then, and then I thought, how am I going to put the UFO cases across? So I thought, well, if you if I start with the first case, which was in you know late 1800s and um, go every 10 years on from there from major cases and again when I started to delve and research which I, I've researched most of these cases anyway like anybody else would where you know you pick up a book and you start reading Chariots of the Gods or uh, Eric Van Danek and you know you, you start somewhere um, so you re research the, the well-known cases but when I actually started to analyze the photographs, I was coming out with more detail that had never been seen before. So as you get deeper into it and you can see, and it was even amazing myself really when I was getting into it even more. Okay, I'd like to um, I'd like to start out talking about one thing. You're probably not gonna be too happy about it, but um, I live on top of a mountain in Maine, and I can over from my house, I can actually see Mount Washington, and mm -hmm. I want to talk about the 1870 Mount Washington um, stereo optic con view card, um, because the only reason I know about that is because I'm local to the mountain, and I also know a uh, UFO researcher that went into great de detail. Um, so go ahead; it's going to be pulled up on the screen right now on uh, YouTube for those uh, people. Uh, watching on YouTube, and I can also put it in the show notes. So this is a stereo opticon. It's a Victorian era stereo opticon view card. You put it you basically where this thing, not you know where you hold it in front of your face, and it's uh, two magnifying glasses, and it holds in front of you, and it actually becomes three dimensional when you look at it with that stereo opticon viewer. Um, so this image actually was researched uh, by a number of people. One of them being Ryan Mullahy in New Hampshire. And uh, it appears so much like it's floating in the clouds. But go ahead and pull up that close-up uh, next. And I know, Jason, I'm sorry you can't see this. Um, yeah, it's all right. It actually becomes a structure um, that is in the snow. And it's awful hard to detect the snow between the cloud. Um, but when the uh, person went to the New York, it's in the New York Public Library, the original image, before it was made into a stereopticon card. Uh, we're also gonna show a couple of other pictures that were taken the very same day, uh, showing the frost elements up on Mount Washington. So um, anyway, basically what that is is a structure on 
that's sitting on top of Mount Washington. And it's basically blended in, you know, with the clouds. So, mm -hmm. um, and that was by the good work of Ryan Mullahy and also another re UFO researcher that actually went to see this original image at the New York uh, Public Library. And because it's an original image, you know how important that is. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see yeah. so much more detail. So, yeah. it, um, so I hate to start out <laughs> on a no, negative, no. but it's a it's one I believe that has been solved. Now I'm not saying it's a hundred percent that it is, but most likely it has been uh, solved as some type of structure. Yeah, um, if if I, I was proven wrong, I'd be the first person to say I was wrong, and you know go back, but. I was going off the photograph that I'd seen and, and analyzed, but if you know somebody's actually been up on site and location, that's even better. Again, you know, I'll certainly look into that one deeper. You know, I I personally was very disappointed because that's a local mountain to me. Like I said, I can mm -hmm. look out my window and see it, and uh, I was thinking, wow, that is such a great case, you know. And I know the. Uh, the original Stereopticon card sold for something like three hundred and eighty dollars on eBay, yeah. and they're worth about five dollars a piece. So that three hundred and eighty dollars is quite a bit of money. Someone yeah. thought they were buying the first original UFO. <laughs> um, are there any other pictures, uh, vintage pictures of UFOs that you've actually um, have found when you're researching? Just generally. Um I wanted to go every 10 years, so obviously I don't do every single photograph, but the next one I went on was the, the Catalan uh, UFO over France, 1910. Um, and it's a, it's a picture, basically, of a racetrack, and you can see the spectators and the car coming around the, around the racetrack itself. And it looks like um, a cigar, cylindrical-shaped craft above. Um, again... Unless you had other photographs and you can go into it in more detail and actually have the original um, photograph, um, you can only really analyze on what you've, you can get or, you know, you can download, et cetera. Um, and again, it was basically for the book where I wanted to just go along the decades and, and try and ease people into, into cases before we got into the more modern you know, modern day photographs. Right, right. Um, I I had the um, woman that, uh, oh, geez, I'm trying to remember the name of the famous UFO photo that was taken by a publisher with a Polaroid um, out of a truck in uh, California. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah, I think so. I haven't got it the access to it in a minute but i know it's at the side of a, a, a truck window is it yes that's right yeah in. and you can see a disc i did think about actually going into that in more depth but i'd already covered a, a case from that era so i sort of didn't go into too many um well that particular that original is available actually and um let's see that was heflin was the name rex heflin mm. and uh so I had uh, I had a woman on my show uh, back in February who actually has that picture, the original um, uh, Polaroids in her in her safe, and right. so um, you can actually see the originals and actually hold them in your hand. But you know, Polaroids, they're not uh, they're a little bit tough, aren't they, to deal with? I mean, they're not quite the quality of a regular photograph, right? No, no, they're not. Um, and again, with with any photograph, you know, whether you're past, modern, you know, I always try and ask for the original photograph the best you can get because um, if you're trying to analyze photographs on, on being on the internet, you don't know how many times that photograph has been posted and reposted, etc. So you're going through third, fourth, fifth generation of the same photograph. And obviously, the more you, you go through this process, the more you know, the quality degrades and it's harder to actually analyze. Yeah, I can get that. Uh, what about videos? Um, do you do a lot of work with that as well? Not the... so much, but I do 
look into videos because you can get frame uh, ca captures from the actual video because obviously there's no other um, photographs available. You have to use the video to get you, what you're actually looking at and then you, you can take a frame from the you know stills from the actual video or footage. Now what I guess it would matter how many frames per second the film is running at. Um, but is digital different than that? Is digital the same thing as far as frames per second? Um, I'm not quite sure whether it would be the... It, you go back to the older cine film, then obviously, yeah, the, the, the actual the running speed, etc., everything is different. So you can actually get more frames in it actually but with the digital it seems you can it depends as well on the on the object how fast it's flying uh you know location lighting there's a lot of thing factors involved in that you know when you you're trying to analyze it and obviously on the quality as well whether it's 1080 or 4k or um you know 720 for the the, the, the pixels in in the actual footage right right I remember I had to, when I got my first iPhone, I can't remember when it was, I was living in California and I remember I, and they were kind of, you know, they were kind of primitive back then as far as video and yeah. filming. But I remember I went out um, in the evening for a walk and I was filming and aiming up at the stars and then I watched it afterwards and it's all these blurs and lines, you know, like um, it looks like a UFO, you know, and I, uh -huh. I can... I have people that will send me pictures. I get, I get a lot of pictures, by the way, you know, uh, yeah. emailed to me. And I'll have people send me pictures of, that looks like the streaks of just basically holding uh, your iPhone or, you know, camera up at the sky and just moving it a little bit. And it makes these, like, streaks across, like light streaks. Yeah. And, you know, I think unless you actually see something with your eye and then see it, you know, in the camera at the same time, you know, the witnesses are pretty important, I think. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's like you just said. There's a lot of factors involved, and if you could see the object, and then you get your camera out and take a photograph, you've got a double aspect of what you've taken. Um, but then you've got also a lot of people. I I get an awful lot of photographs from people who have taken uh, pictures, or uh, and if you actually look at the footage, um, they're, they're like an orb shape in it. But it's just lens flare from the sun, which is it's very common. I know there's so many lens flare photos, um, mm -hmm. and then there's also some Google Earth uh, pink UFOs, which is actually yeah. uh, have you heard of that? There's a yeah, uh, yeah. Mark D'Antonio. Are you familiar with who he is? No, no. He is uh, the MUFON, you know, video photo analyst, uh, basically, um, and he does a lot of work for them. He's also mm -hmm. does special effects and models and things like that. But um, he and I were basically arguing with this guy on Facebook <laughs> and then we gave up and just let the guy think what he wants to think. But he was he was saying we were the government against him and everything else. And all we were saying is those are well known. Uh, those pink UFOs are well known uh, lens flares. Yeah. And they do. Yeah. They, they're, they're actually convincing. I can understand why someone can look at that and say, wow, that's mm -hmm. a disc right there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and sometimes you do have to sort of back away and let people just get on with it because you're just going to upset somebody, aren't you, for for no reason when if they want to believe they've seen something, then so be it. And well, after, so I just got to tell you because I think this is kind of humorous. So this guy basically was telling me to, you know, bug off and like um, I was a government idiot and a debunker and, and, you know, so anyway, he obviously searched my Facebook page after that. And then he found out that I have an interest in antiques and I, you know, I'm a appraiser in antiques. So he started sending me pictures of a, a glass. I hate to even say this, but a glass urinal. <laughs> he wanted to know how valuable it was. And I said, oh, my God, I just kind of deleted it and moved on. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's uh, there's you can attract some a uh, couple of crazies actually <laughs> out there. Um, so let's talk about some of the more convincing ones that you've looked at. Uh, when I say convincing, I mean 
unexplainable uh, UFOs that you've actually studied and, and tried to figure out what they were. Yeah, sure. Uh, from the book or? Yeah, yeah, from, go ahead um, from the book, yeah. sure. Yeah, um, but, well, one of the convincing ones, which I've, I've looked at myself for years, is the, the battle over Los Angeles, oh, yeah. which is 1942. And um, it, again, that to this day is still um, unidentified. And it was a large craft that came over. And I, I was like everybody else. I'd just seen the original photographs, or well, the latest, the best I could find. Um, and they basically show you the, the searchlights, which are on this, this um, object. It, it looks sort of diamond-shaped, um, initially, that when you look at it, and um, you can see the searchlights on it, you can see the uh, artillery. They were actually firing at it. Are, are you? Um, do you know about this case? Or oh yes, it's it's always yeah. fascinated me. I know. Uh, for one, uh, David Marler was going to start working on that. Um, I he was going to start out researching that. I know a number of people have, um, mm. but it's all that's always fascinated me. That's that's a great. Very unusual case. I know there was something like uh, uh, either two or four people that were actually killed. Um, yeah, I think it was more. I think it was about, um, oh, I did have a thing somewhere where I, it was more like eight people or maybe about three people were killed in a car crash and people had a couple of other people had heart attacks. Right. Um, you know, the, it was. Um, and then, and then uh, actually from some of the shells. Uh, the shells landing. falling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of people um, killed from that. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, I think America had just come into the the, um, the Second World War, so the, the the military and people must have thought that it was um, a Japanese craft or German Luftwaffe aircraft coming over. So obviously, the, it was a free for all. Everybody opened up at this thing, and it just didn't move at all. It was moving slowly through the, the skyline of um, Los Angeles, but um, they didn't bring it down or anything. And, uh, you know, to this day, they, they still don't know. Did you ever hear about during the World War II, the Japanese had these balloons that they would launch into the prevailing winds uh, uh, eastward toward um, the L.A., you know, the California coastline? Yeah, I did. Yeah, um, they used to put incendiary devices on them, didn't they? On, yeah. on like a, a, a crude, yeah, um, very crude release <laughs> release, <laughs> release mechanism, and it would. Um, well, their intention was to to release the bombs over the city, weren't they? And then they would they would go very high and go on, you know, um, eventually get to America and that region and, and release the bombs. Yeah, can you imagine if that war was now <laughs> with the technology we have now? I mean, it's yeah. so so funny. I mean, it is very primitive, you know, yeah. and that whole. But it was just anything to get us. That was uh, that, that yeah. was kind of scary. But um, and that's what that's why everybody must have thought that night. You know, with yeah. the the craft coming over, it was something to do with with coming into the war, etc. And um, uh, when, when I actually analysed the photographs, I don't know if you've seen them in the book, the, the detail that came out of the craft, and you can actually see um, structure to the craft itself. Really? Yeah, it's it amazed myself, really, when, when I actually set to work on it, because, like I said, the, the actual um, case, I, I, I've always been interested in it, like most people, for years, but I thought it'd be a good one for the book, but... And I thought, well, nobody's ever gone down the road of analysing the photographs to the depth that, that I did myself. And um, the detail that came out, it, it doesn't even look diamond-shaped anymore. You know, and it's, uh, I don't know if you've got a photograph there at all that you can see. or I just have a, I have a picture up on my own screen, but not from your book. Ah. It just shows up. It shows the uh, searchlights, you know, zeroing in on something with uh, probably the shells uh, blasting overhead. I think they they shot off something like 1,500 rounds, right, or something like that? Yeah, 
yeah, an, an awful lot. Um, and like I said, this thing did, it was still there. It didn't move. It didn't. So they didn't bring it down or damage it in any way. Do you know what made them stop firing? <laughs> I mean, did it go I, away? I don't. Yeah, yeah, it did actually disappear over the skyline slowly. It was slowly moving all the time, but Jeez. not um, not like it was trying to evacuate the 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 area under fire. You know. And um, it, it was lost over the skyline, I think. But um, well, obviously that's why they gave up shooting at it, you know, because it's out of range. Do you know how they first were aware of it? Was it a radar? Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, was it radar? Or how did they first know that it was over L.A.? I don't actually know how it first intentioned, but... Um, Obviously, the first thing people knew was when the searchlights were all on it and it it was all illuminated and then obviously the firing started and all hell broke loose and, you know, on from there. But it, 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 looking through the, the book with the, the photographs and you do see the um, what the craft looks like, it doesn't look anything like the original photograph that you see, you know, where you can just see a... a, a well, the, the the object is illuminated, so it, you get a glazed look over it. There's no real detail on it. But when you use the filters and things and bring out the detail, you can see the structure to it. You know, this was, uh, you know, five years prior to the, what they term the modern, <laughs> the modern ufology, um, you know, mm -hmm. after Roswell, basically. All the sightings that began in 1947 on. Uh, yeah. So this was five years ahead of that. Had anyone ever brought up at that time that it was possibly, you know, a UFO? Or was that like after the fact, many years after the fact? I think it was more after the fact because at the time, I think that's what they thought it was. It was something it was involved in the, in the war effort and, yeah. um, you know, related to them actually three months prior getting it after Pearl Harbor and things like that, and it, everything progressed. Uh, um, yeah, I think it was a lot later on that they actually, it, it, it went down the road of the UFO, which that was the term that came out later to Kenneth Arnold, wasn't it, with um, the flying disc, etc. So, you know, uh, things progressed from there on, but going way, way back, UFOs have been seen for millennia. They, they go back; it's all documented, isn't it? To, um... Yeah, it's funny. It just, you know, when you do any type of research, or I know Jacques Vallée with another author did uh, work on, you know, real early sightings going as far back as they could research. Um, mm. You know, these sightings occurred, but they were never on the regular basis. Uh, well, I say that now we're co so connected, you know, prior to being so connected as we are now, there may have been sightings, you know, but just that we're mm. no one ever had any place to report them or no one ever reported them. No. You know, no. you think you think of, uh, you know, 100 years ago or 150 years ago, you know, there may have been many sightings that never made it to paper, you know, written down or. Or even uh, yeah. ver verbalized or told. So well, I've started um, partly started um, my next book, um, and I'm going into sightings and different things, um, close encounters, because obviously close encounters comes under seven different categories of first, second, third, and fourth, etc. Um, but just just to skirt over it, really, but. Um, Going back in ancient e Egypt, there was a sighting by the pharaohs and it was reported of uh, orbs that had come over. And um, but I don't want to give too much away because I want to put it in the next book. But, you know, as you're just saying, going back, that there are documented, you know, uh, examples of sightings that are, that are there if you look. Yeah, yeah. Um... I, I have not bought uh, Shock's uh, book in particular, but I would like to get it just to, because that, mm. that really does fascinate me. Now, I know there's, there's uh, one that is, has been debunked, 
the Alexander the Great uh, sighting um, that they saw a shield during a battle up in the sky and all that. Um, yeah. And uh, but anyway, that ended up only being able to be researched back, I think, to 1954 in a novel or some or a fiction a novel um, that uh, anyway, that was basically as far back as it could be researched. So right. I, I don't think that one actually holds um, any water in particular. But there are so many more, you know, besides that, that, you know, really uh, are, are uh, have been written down, which is, is quite amazing. Yeah. And so uh, before we go on in your book, let's talk about um, the sighting in France and the helicopter. These two objects go by it. Um, was that is that actually in your book or is that just something you've looked at? No, that, that's actually in my book. Um, okay, so you don't some... mind if we skip around a little bit? No, no, fine. Um, yeah. That was um, a ship that had run aground off the French coast. Um, I think it was Anglet on, on the French coast. And the ship was a cargo ship, which is called the Luno. And, well, basically it ran aground. And, and the footage I actually saw... Well, when was it? It was going way back, 2014, I think. I originally yeah. saw the the photo, the the images, and and the footage. And the footage was taken from a uh, local television news um, broadcast, which has since mysteriously gone missing. We can't seem to trace it now. Um, but I managed to get the the short piece out of the footage. That I, I was basically watching it because the interest was the, the the ship which had run aground, and obviously it was a storm, etc. And um, people were being rescued by the helicopters, so you know you, you, you watch this sort of thing. And as I was watching the footage, these two objects flew right behind. It was a military French military helicopter that had got there first, who were winching people off the ship. And as I was watching it, um, these two objects, which are in the book, you can see all the photographs. And if you look on my YouTube channel, the footage is there as well. And you can see the two craft. And I, I describe as craft that they're in close formation and they fly right behind the helicopter off to the side. And at first impression, I thought maybe they were birds or you know, the, the usual type of thing. And because you can see other birds flying around. Um, and when I analyze, I thought, well, I'll take a closer look, analyze them in more detail. When I actually looked closer, they, they look metallic uh, in shape and size and, and they stayed exactly the same distance from each other. And then I'm, I was starting to think, well, were they drones? Were they something that were being used by the military at the time as a help? But then they wouldn't be flying drones in those conditions and especially not close to rescue helicopters, etc. cetera. So um, I, I thought it'd be a good one to put in the book, which you know, obviously everyone can see it there in the book. Now, was this first noticed by when they were doing the newscast of it or how did, how did this come out? No, no. Um, it was, it was myself. Um, I was actually watching the footage and like I said, it wasn't it, the UFOs were the bonus sort of thing because I wasn't watching for UFOs. I was watching because <laughs> the, the ship had run aground and it was an interesting story and they were being rescued you know, with the helicopter. And then I sat up and took more notice because it was a military helicopter. And I thought, Oh yeah. Okay. Maybe they got there first. And, and you start asking more questions. And, and then as I was watching the footage, the broadcast, um, the, the two objects flew past and, I, and it made me sit up and, and I thought I've got to, get a still of that i've got to get, have a look and take a proper look myself and it sort of progressed from there boy so you're actually the person that actually uncovered this yeah yeah it was yeah wow that's that's actually really and, and it's funny you said you weren't expecting to see ufos are we ever <laughs> <laughs> no. we're, 
<laughs> no, not when um, not when you go out intentionally trying to look for them. But um, yeah, no, it, it was myself who found the, the the UFOs within the footage, and it it wasn't of UFOs originally. I was looking. I didn't even record it. I managed to get a re, um, a, a video clip that was on YouTube, and like I said, since. I've had people approach me. I mean, it's gone huge. It's made all the newspapers, the New York Post. It went everywhere. This, this, right. It went all over the world. I had producers of all the channels asking for permission to show it. And, of course, I'm going to say yes. As you know, I just found it. Uh, I'm not into that side of thing. You know, I want, I want the, the truth out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, you know, they think it's all been sort of, made and, and that's how exactly how it came about i was watching the the the, the ship run aground etc and, and and i thought and i saw them and i thought oh because i generally watch footage that people send me uh photographs and other things and i'm always looking for the <laughs> the other things that are happening i don't always look at the the main event if you know what i mean right right uh i know that uh um, you must have been interested in at least talking to people and finding out more about the Rindlesham Forest case. I know that happened in 1980. Um, yeah. Because it was at, you know, the RF, uh, RAF yeah. Bentwaters. Um, so that in particular, um, supposedly there were some pictures taken, but uh, I think they said they never came out. I think that's what it was. Well, yeah, the 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 it was over a couple of nights on the base, wasn't it? Um, yeah. And um, I'm supposed to actually be going down there and spending the night in the forest down there. Um, I haven't got I haven't <laughs> got round to it yet. Yeah. Because uh, I've got a couple of friends down there um, who were into the you know research etc. And I think um, Colonel Holt, I'll get to meet Colonel Holt. He's coming over for a conference in the UK. Uh, ah. The Outer Outer Limits uh, magazine, who I wrote articles for as well, uh, in Hull. Um, I think it's September. I can't remember the actual date. I think it's September, but it's all it's all there on the internet. And Colonel Holt's going to be one of the speakers, so um, I can have a proper chat with him. Hopefully, when he comes over. But um, he's yeah, very he's very approachable guy. I met him first down in uh, North Carolina about four four or five years ago. Oh, right. Yeah. Very approachable, nice guy. Mm-hmm. Um, likes things just so, though. You know, I mean, he's he's very <laughs> particular, and, you know, someone that's going to be a commander of a base is going to be like that. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, at the time, uh, it, this was a few years after, because it was, uh, I think it was 1980, Rendlesham Forest incident happened. But in the... I think it was sort of the mid eighties onwards when I was at RF Cosford for my first time. I've been at Cosford a couple of times on different tours. Um, we used to get, um, go out on detachments and things where we'd, um, go and do guard duty at other bases. Um, one of the bases I went to was, uh, Green and Connor, uh, you know, where you used to have the, the protesters there for the nuclear weapons. Don't know if you remember that on the news. You saw mm-hmm. all the women there, um, and that was the, the nearest base to uh, Bent Waters and up there. Because Rendlesham Forest is the is the actual forest there. It's Bent Waters and Woodbridge are the two military bases there. Yeah, Woodbridge, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and I have a uh, uh, Peter Robbins is coming up in a couple of weeks, and one of mm-hmm. the uh, conversations we're going to have. Uh, is uh, he had a falling out with uh, his co-author. We're going to be talking a little bit about that, um, Larry. So uh, there was a question, that, not really a question. Someone said the best UFO case, and this is up in the chat room, the best UFO case in the UK is the Alan Godfrey encounter. Are you familiar with that? Um, yeah, um, not in detail, obviously, but I, I didn't know we were going to discuss it. But, um, <laughs> yeah, Alan was a, a, a policeman. He was on duty at the time. Um, not sure if it was the seventies, 
and um, he was with a colleague. Um, they had a close encounter. A ship came down, and um, it's quite well documented. And he's had quite a few talks. He started to do conferences and things like that. So um, I've missed his last one he did. So I hope I'm going to try and catch him, you know, when he does one. I have a guest coming up in a few weeks that the whole show is going to be about uh, police officers and UFO encounters. That should mm -hmm. be, uh, that should be, to me, I think, and I, I've had an argument, and I've kind of argued this fact with uh, someone before, a skeptic, that I think that, uh, actually, personally, I think that police officers are good observers. I think that uh, mm -hmm. they're very credible. I mean, yeah. I think they're the last people in the world that want to talk about a UFO, you know, really. I mean, for the ridicule, you go all the way back to uh, Lonnie Zamora, you know, in the Socorro mm -hmm. case, um, you know, didn't want any of the hassle of reporting what he saw, but, you know, a uh, very, very credible mm -hmm. person. Uh, yeah. But anyway, I always like those uh, those cases. Yeah, no, most people like to listen to those, like you just said, for the credibility of the, the people and the witnesses. Right. And witnesses are like... Uh, are is such a big piece of the puzzle and mm. in your research in your book did you try to actually talk to people or did you read accounts of uh of witnesses it really was cases first that there's a couple in there there was um uh, i think there's one at the beginning where it's a misidentification um just really go to the beginning. Uh, Philip Mantle, he actually sent me two photographs um, of a sighting or supposedly sighting that somebody had taken. And the, the gentleman was, um, he was actually a civilian, uh, a civilian um, passenger aircraft pilot. Uh, Brazil, I'm sure he was Brazilian. Anyway, he was over in Wiltshire, in the UK on holiday and he took photographs and what the two photographs I was sent by Philip first one straight away I could see it was a military aircraft it was a, a tornado it was actually the, the type of aircraft I'd worked on in the Air Force before so I knew straight away that it was a military aircraft but the second photograph the center of the photo, it's in the book, you can see it again. It, the center of the photograph is a flagpole with a Union Jack flag on the top. And obviously that was the focus of his, fo his photograph that he was taking, his topic. And either side of the flagpole, you can see two, they look like disc shaped objects. Um, and when I first saw it, I did actually think, oh, we might have something here, you know, I'll go and do a proper analysis of it and see what I can come up with. And then when obviously I did do the analysis and got further into it, they, they too were military aircraft. Hmm. And when I got into the detail, and again, it's all there for you to see, one of the aircraft was banking and it was two more military aircraft again. And one was banking and one was actually flying away. And, and what I've actually done is do silhouettes of the aircraft type um, next to it so you can make a comparison and you can see it for yourself. And when you do see it, you go, oh, yeah, of course, that's what it is. But first impression of the photograph and et cetera, they were UFOs because they were unidentified. Well, you know, there's, there's really something about when an aircraft is banking and turning and you know, I mean, there are certain times that you could snap a picture or see it, you know, even in a video where it, it looks unusual and doesn't look like uh, an aircraft at all, especially, you know, at a, at a distance. Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, I just wanted to announce uh, I'm going to be doing a uh, for the people on YouTube. It's going to be on YouTube only um, this Sunday evening um, on the 29th. I think it's nine o'clock. I'm going to be live uh, uh, doing like a simulcast with a radio station. I'm going to be talking UFOs, um, but that will be here on my YouTube channel, 9 o'clock Sunday night. And it's also going to be on KGRA, um, uh, a radio host over there. Uh, Cobra is how, his name, but we're going to be talking UFOs. So Sunday night, 
any YouTube listener can listen to that. So we're at the top of the hour. So if um, people would like to call in, that number is going to be displayed right on the screen right now. So um, you can call in that number, um, ask our guests a question. Um, and uh, I'd like to also talk about the Argentine case. That was uh, that was another one. And, of course, I do want you to talk about other cases, but these were actually pictures you sent me and I, a video you sent me. And mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, actually play that video um, up on uh, the Argentine video um, just so our listeners, uh, I mean, uh, YouTube listeners, that is, can actually see it play. So we're going to run that now while we're talking about it. Can you explain, um, and it's a, it's a, uh, just a iPhone video, so it's a, a vertical video, small vertical yeah. video. But can you explain how that uh, pilot um, actually caught that? I mean, that's such a bizarre thing. Yeah, um, it was an Argentine uh, civilian pilot. Um, and he'd actually seen UFOs before um, this this actual footage he took himself, um, but he didn't take a camera or a phone up with him, um, etc., to to take the photograph um, or footage. So um, this time, he he sort of expected that he was going to see something. Um, obviously, he doesn't want his name out there, and you know, for his job or etc. I'm not sure, but you know, it's. Um, confidentiality it's a uh, you've got to respect that um but the as you can see you can see the footage plane you can see the propeller going in front of him he's looking through forward through the forward um, windscreen of the aircraft and he can obviously see the objects coming up from his um, left hand side of the aircraft at high velocity towards his craft and he must have been thinking it's it's either going to hit his crack, his, his airplane, et cetera. You, you just don't know. And then you'll see in the video, you can see a larger craft pass right in front of the his aircraft, dangerously close. And it's followed by a smaller craft. And he's obviously feeling a bit whatever because you can see the camera shake, et cetera. Um, and then... He's looking at the two craft, but still filming forwards, which I wish he'd actually turned his camera, but he didn't. He, he carried on filming forwards. The two objects then grouped together on the right-hand side of his aircraft and then came back in front of his aircraft in close formation, again at high velocity, right in front, and then took off. Uh, to the left again as he flew on, and then he put his phone down. So you can see all this in the footage. Amazing. And um, now why does this propeller look like that? Is that just because of the filming or something? It looks yeah, like it's moving very slowly. Yeah, you'll you you, you you'll get that effect through any propeller um, when you're filming it. You'll get the the effect like it's moving slowly. You get the effect on car wheels sometimes, or bike. Uh, when you were a child with your bike, you could put lights on your 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 spokes of your wheels, and yeah. as the as you go fast, it gives the illusion, doesn't it, of going slowly or backwards? Or oh yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's it's the same sort of effect with the propeller. It's, it's the revolutions are so fast. It, the camera just picks up fractions of them, you know, as they're moving. I see, I see. Um, so this is just bizarre that he had seen them before and that he actually decided to film this time. I mean, was he flying over the same basic area that he flew before? I mean, how did he, how did I this happen? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know whether he just, he had seen them before. I don't know how many times he'd seen uh, UFOs before. Um, and he just expected to see them again, so he took his camera, his, his phone with him this time, um, and that's why the film footage is in the, it's not in a, a landscape view, it's in the the vertical view, like a, a taken on a mobile phone. So, and, and the older mo mobile phones, obviously the quality isn't as good as a, in a, a phone nowadays, so... Um, the quality is the best at the time, I suppose. Um, but it fascinates me. It's one of my favorites. 
Absolutely. When was this taken, actually? I think it was 2014. Again. So there's two two of these, right? The same year. Yeah. Yeah. I wow. think it was, yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah I, I still watch it now. I still have to click on and have a look every, every now and again, and I just think, yeah, wow. And I've shown other um, um, ufologists uh, when I've been to conferences because I've had this footage for quite a while and I've posted it a while back. But obviously when I first started, a lot of people didn't follow the page or uh, you didn't really get the, the coverage like I do now when I put something out there. So a lot of videos I've got, if you go back over my archives on YouTube, um, really, there's some really good footage on there. Do you happen to know how fast the airplane itself was going approximately? I don't know how fast, but it's a cruise in altitude. And it, your first impression, you can see the cloud base. So it, it's probably around about four or 5,000 feet. So you can rule out... Um, bugs and um, insects at that altitude. Um, uh, people have said that you get them, but the, the more you look at the footage, the more you look at the... I mean, the footage is there for anybody to look at. It's there for anybody to analyse or to have a look themselves. So, you know, if, yeah. if somebody comes back with something else I haven't seen, I'd be made up, you know, to see something that I haven't seen. Has anyone... Uh, suggested that they're birds because that's a, the very first thing I thought mm. was birds. But then when they come back, I mean, it just doesn't, you know, no. <laughs> unless there were two no. other birds, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it just mean, doesn't it, seem to make sense. E even if it was birds on the first pass, I don't think they would come back again. Yeah. You know, plus do the a planes, planes moving along at, at least a yeah. hundred knots, 150 knots. At, um, at so, least. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the birds would have to be going forwards as well as sideways <laughs> <laughs> to come back and to come back in formation. It's just, you no, know, the, the more you watch the actual footage, the actually the more questions you start asking. Yeah. I know a swift can go on a downward turn. I sound like I'm in Monty Python's Search for the Holy Grail. But I know... Uh, <laughs> A swift can do a downward, um, you know, at like 200 miles an hour, but it's using the angle and the and the wind and all that to, to be able to do that type of speed. And it's a downward speed, too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. But there's no bird that's going to be flying ahead of an airplane. Not I, not that I know not, of. Not unless it's going to be um, a bird strike. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. So, again, um, we are taking calls. If someone would like to uh, uh, give our guest a call. We'd love to have you uh, call in. And that number is coming right up on our screen here in a second. It's, uh, again, you can call in during the show only, if you would, that number is only live during the show. It's uh, 603-967-4030. Let's talk about some other, um, some other uh, uh, photos or things that you worked on in, in the book in particular. Um, I'm just trying to come up with some really good ones. I mean, they're all good in their own respect and, you know, through the decades going through. I mean, I've got a, a friend of mine over here in the UK, um, Marie Kayali, and she's been having experiences and she's got a lot of videos on YouTube of her experiences and et cetera. Um, you know, really good sightings and she was actually over in Sri Lanka and took photographs of a, a disc-shaped object. And you can see it there on the photographs I analysed. And I didn't really have to do an awful lot of um, uh, detail on this one because the photographs were that good. Um, and she is constantly taking photographs now in the UK um, of the chemtrails and seeing orb-shaped craft around the chemtrails themselves um, mm. and I've analysed quite a few photographs and when you get in close to them and see them they look metallic um, and she can see multiple craft around the chemtrails in and out um, they're, they're quite amazing to see really 
Uh, we have a caller that just called in, so I'd like to take the call. And caller, your first name and where are you calling from? Uh, Steve, I'm calling from Washington State. Hi, Steve. Welcome to the show. Do you have a Thank question you. for our guest? Uh, yeah. Um, I Just a couple comments real quick. Um, when you said at the beginning of the show that his sighting was when he was seven, um, that, that's the same for me. And, and uh, the result of that has been my whole life I've kind of followed ufology. I don't believe most of what I hear, but, uh, but I just I thought that was interesting. That's one of the things I always look for. Um, when I hear somebody talk about a sighting is do they have that sense of wonderment that because that that has stayed with me my whole life and like when I hear Bob Lazar talk I just I never hear any of that it's always like this beast of burden um, hmm. that you know uh, so I, I thought that was interesting and uh, my my question has to do with Rendlesham um, I'm, I'm assuming you're familiar with uh, the whole memo that he wrote that caused the whole thing to be released to the public, the one page memo. Have you read that? I uh, have part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Part of it. Yeah. Okay. So I've tried to ask him this. I've tried to get a straight answer on this in that memo. He talks about lights being visible to the North of the base for out uh, for an hour and to the South of the base for three hours. And yet nobody ever talks about scrambling jets. No. No, they don't actually. And, and I mean, to me, that's, this, is, this is during the Cold War, and this is tip of the spear. I mean, this base had bombers, and they did have nukes because I've heard them say in interviews, they can't say there was nukes, but they, they go to great lengths to identify the non-nuclear storage. Yeah. So, uh -huh. so they'll yeah. say. These I'm guessing you're right here. on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I just maybe, I mean, does that? This is the whole problem with having a sighting at seven, and having to follow ufology for all these years. When you there's these giant holes in these cases that just don't make any sense. When you have mm. like got bogeys in the sky. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. I, I couldn't yeah. hear Martin. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, no, I I'm just wondering go wondering ahead. if you have a take on that and do you look for do you look for that when you research a case if do you try and tie in that sense of wonderment that you got from your sighting? Yeah, you, you generally try to look at what when you get a sighting or anything else related to the uh, site and you generally try to look at all the um things that could happen around it so other sightings of um civilian aircraft other military aircraft um anything generally around that area or location of the sighting weather comes into fact you know it goes back to the old days people say you you saw swamp gas which is a joke really but you know, other weather conditions can affect things as well. Um, I've got a good friend in the UK, um, Paul Sinclair. He does uh, Truth Proof, and he does a lot of research into military and UFOs and things like that, especially in the UK. And to be to be honest, yeah, you do get an awful lot of when when something is sighted, you'll get the military will do scramble aircraft to go and then again you go back over the decades where in the earlier days they were always told to shoot on site and then they lost too many aircraft through uh, sightings and being brought down etc so they were told not to shoot and just observe and but that's the first time I've actually thought about what you just said where no one's ever said before about scrambling military aircraft to it one thing well, I want to, if I can ahead. just interject right here for just a second, one thing I was noticing up in the chat room, they were talking about the radar. Um, now, the radar, actually, the memo itself was misdated. It was dated, uh, there was an error in the date. It was one, date, one day off. Um, so 
when they started doing research initially into the radar, um, there was nothing shown on radar, but it was the wrong day. So it actually did uh, come back as they actually did have a uh, radar uh, on on that uh, those objects actually when, yeah. well, when they researched this, it. To me, this wouldn't be that big a problem if it wasn't three hours. I mean, he put it's ice visible for three hours. Yeah, why to they me, never scrambled I, jets? That does that. That is something I have not thought of, Steve, and that's actually a really good point. Yeah, it is a really good point. Yeah, I just I got a huge problem with that. And just one quick compliment. James Fox said something I thought was the most brilliant thing about ideology uh, about ufology um, that really really fits with your book. And uh, just from listening to your interview, and that he said, you know, the topic is the topic is uh, is compelling enough by itself. And if you can just bring credibility to it, you've got a winner. And and your book sounds like that. Um, that the problem listening to ufology is you get so many people are just out there like Pluto, and uh, <laughs> and I, your book sounds like it's it really goes right at just bringing legitimacy to mm -hmm. you know bringing real physical evidence to to the public, and so a compliment for you. Thank hey, you, Steve. Thanks for the call. Yeah, thank you guys. All right, take care. Uh -huh. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, that that is something, um, you know, when. Uh, oh, by the way, the name of your book, I want you to actually hold your book. up. I know you have it in front of yeah. you. I've been watching yeah. you go through it. I know. <laughs> um, and uh, you got to move it around a little bit. There. Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. OK, so it's UFO photo and it's kind of yeah. I love the way you kind of join the two names there. UFO yes. photo is the name of the book. And now let me just ask you, what type of photos do you have inside of this book? Do you have actually, um, you know, good, clear pictures? Do you show examples? Yeah, well, some are on the front there you can see yeah. that are in the book itself um, and where they analyze the the UFOs. I mean, there was one where the Trent, um, going back to the Trent case. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And that they're, they're actually, see them there. And I uh -huh. actually found when I analyzed the photographs in, in more depth and went into it in more detail that um, I could find, um, to me, I, they look like uh, exhaust pipes on the back of an aircraft. And mm. I, I, I thought maybe that the aircraft was actually flying away from. So it looks like a disc. Because when I actually, again, analyzed the photograph, went into more detail, you can see... Um, they look like two wings on the side, How which again, yeah. yeah. So if you, if you go in and see it, um, um, again, it's it's just my take. It's just my opinion, um, and everybody else will have their own opinion on the book. And that's really my aim with the book is to just put the cases out there for people to see. The analysed photographs I've done, detail in the book, and then let them come up with their own idea. Now the McMinnville UFO photographs have. Did you look into that one in particular? Is that in your book? Someone I actually yes. had someone send me that question. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, Nineteen fifty. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the Trent UFO, isn't it? Yeah, McMinnville, and um, I basically with that one. That's the one I did find where. The, there was two main photographs, original photographs. And what I did, I did an overlay of the two photographs. Then it proves that the object has moved. The person has moved too, who took the photographs. It, mo it proves that they have actually moved. Um, and that was the one where I went into more detail. I don't know if you can see it on there, where I went into more detail on the craft. Yeah. So can you see that? And yes, you can uh -huh. actually see the the two exhausts there. Oh, so this is the one. Uh, oh, this, okay. So this is the one you were just talking about. That's the one uh, I was just talking Mc, about. Where McVinville, McVinville and Trent. I see. Yeah, Trent's farm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. And above, uh, you can see on the craft above. You see the. Um, it looks possible antenna, but it also could be a fin, like a, a fin of an aircraft. Now, when you so look at the picture at a distance. It looks like a perfectly shaped disc, yeah. You know, <laughs> but uh, but I can see where you're getting at now. I know that uh, Mark D'Antonio 
I actually thought he had, he was the one I spoke about earlier, that the MUFON photo analyst, video analyst. Yeah. He actually yeah. thought he could see something a little fishy about that photograph. I'll have to ask him what he's, he found. Yeah, I, I, everyone's detail. And again, like I said, with the, whether you could see the, I could see the wings on the side. Oh, so wow. I've actually outlined them there, see them there. And then mm-hmm. underneath is a, a separate UFO case of a craft that looks very similar. Wow. So, so you think this thing was actually heading away from them I think when they took was, the picture? Yeah, actually flying away. So you've got the two tail. People have also said they could be um, windows. Again, it's up to what people see in the photographs. But um, my interpretation is, again, a lot of these cases, when I looked into more detail, they just seem to um, offer up more questions, really, that you'd be thinking, well, that's not what I used to see. It's not what I used to look at in a photograph, and I don't remember it being that way. But when you go into detail and you see it with the filtered photographs and the um, the enhancement of the photograph, more things come out. Now, what it, this, is, this is kind of a little bit off topic, but... All right, so every year they celebrate the McMinnville. <laughs> they have a festival to celebrate the McMinnville uh, picture, UFO pictures. Uh, what happens to people that are vested in the story? You know, I mean, I see, I've see, i seen this happen where someone is vested in a story and they don't want uh, to back down. They, they want to hang on to it. It's their, it's their bailiwick. It's their... I don't mm. want to say cash cow because no one really makes a lot of money at, anyway from mm. from any of this. But I mean, it's it's something they have. You encountered anything like that? We have a call coming in. Why don't we hold that thought and we'll get to it? Okay. Yep. Yeah, sure. Uh, caller, uh, welcome to the show. Your first name and where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Abner, calling from Florida. Okay. I don't know if you have bad connection. I can barely hear you. How are you doing? Calling from Florida. My name is Ed. All right. Maybe you should uh, try to hold the phone away from you just a little bit. And uh, you have a question for our guest? Can you hear me now? Yeah, that sounds a little better. Yes. Yeah, I have a question for the guest. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just ask him, what is his uh, favorite case in the U.K., whether it's from, you know, Cody Town or 1 to 7? Can you understand that? I think your phone is acting up. I got fa- the favorite. What is my favorite case? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, well, the, the, the Cosford case, obviously, the, um, had a lot to do with and um, with Nick Pope and things like that. So a lot of research into it. Um Rendlesham, I do like Rendlesham Forest, obviously the case, but if you look into Paul Sinclair, who's another ufologist, um, and he's got two books out, Truth, Proof, One and Two, um, if you look at his cases, he comes up with um, really bizarre things that have happened and sightings that people have reported to him, because he's a real, um, likes to get out in the field and investigate um and he also has talks as well you can watch um i think you'll you'll get a lot of um good sightings from him um throughout the uk the sightings all the time just like in america and everywhere around the world um and again d- depending you'll get different types of craft cylindrical um triangular disc shaped orbs the orbs are seem to be more now um becoming more um with the chemtrails and things like that i do get an awful lot of people sending me pictures of orbs and and within the orbs as well when i've analyzed photographs of those you can actually make out faces and whether they're extraterrestrial interdimensional beings we don't know but um i've also done videos on that where and photographs. So, um, yeah, there's just so many sightings, and and they keep coming in all the time. You know, I have to analyze quite a few. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the call. Thanks. All right. Thank thank you. you. All right. You know, 
I don't remember the question I asked you before the call. <laughs> I should have written it down. <laughs> um, you neither, right? Okay. Yeah. So it, must, it was not that important. We have another call coming in. Thank goodness. It's actually, it looks like it's coming in from my home state here. Right. Hello. Okay. Welcome to the show. And uh, what's your first name and where are you calling from? I'm calling from Maine and my name's Don Dion. Hey, Don. Um, how you doing? Don. So we're in the same state, Good. by the way. I don't know if you know that. I did know that as I was watching the show earlier. Yeah. Yep. How are you? Good. I, you know, I still have snow here. I don't know where you're at in Maine, but I actually have about, uh, in my backyard, I have almost a foot of snow still. Melting, but I still have it. I'm from the Turner area. Um, actually, Jason's done a lot of my photographs from the Turner Triangle. Yeah, Don's actually got um, uh, one of the cases in my book. Oh, really? Yeah. How about that? So do you have a question you or you just want to talk about that? Um, well, yeah, Jason has done some excellent work. Um, he's done many sightings over the years for me. And I must have been hard to pick which one he was going to put in the book. <laughs> was it Jason? Yeah, uh, yeah. I had some incredible sightings, like from Christmas, uh, that Christmas footage where a craft comes in and then what it appears to be a portal that opens up. Wow. You just have so many different sightings. that I, 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 The one I put in the book was um, one. But first impression, when you look, you think it's like a bird or not, when I've had them in the past, but it's not because when you actually go into detail, um, I don't know if you've got photographs of it there. It's a bit more difficult if you could see the photographs, but... Um, Don's got some really amazing sightings. Now, uh, Don... I, I want so, to thank you, Jason. Oh, go ahead. Don, uh, you say you're from the Turner area. Um, I heard there was someone up, up in, someone up along the up, coast that was getting a lot of UFO photos. Are you familiar with who that is? Um, off the coast, uh, any... In Maine. You know where? No, no, I just heard there was some Eastern. someone up in Maine that was getting a lot of UFO photos. I just wondered if you happen to know who that was. Uh, I'm aware of one that happened around Christmas time, but other than that, um, no. Yeah. Um, well, do you, have I, a, I, do you actually have a question for Jason, or you just wanted to talk about your, your photos, which is really I, I quite amazing. I just wanted to congratulate Jason on his book. Um, he really works hard. And if you want an independent opinion, Jason will give you his true opinion on what your photograph or video is. And That's great. Thank you so much, Jason, for your hard work. Yeah, thanks, Don. Yeah. Yeah. Don, yeah, thank you, you for the call. All right. Have a good night. All right. You too. Uh, so right. you are you obviously are very available for for people to to contact. Yes. Um, yeah. And, um, and how does one, I can't remember, I found you on Facebook. How does one find you? You generally do find me on Facebook. Um, you can contact me through Messenger, Twitter. Um, uh, I think Instagram, I think I've got something on there as well. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty approachable if, if people want something explaining in a photograph. Um you know, I'll try my best to analyze it for them. Um, if they don't, if they want to bring their name forward and they want me to post what they've seen, um, I'll, I'll quite willingly do that for them. But if they also want um, strict confidence and don't want their name bringing forward, I'll respect that for them. Their wishes have been confidentiality. It's um, it's quite a big thing. You know, if you lose the confidentiality in someone who's trying to give an experience to you um, then you know you, you've lost it really so now how do you find do you find that remaining about the same or do you think that's loosened up a little bit where people are actually afraid to say who they are you know to be identified with a UFO? no it's definitely definitely loosened up it's definitely become more available uh, and people aren't asked don't really want um when, when they come forward with a picture of a, a being or um, 
a craft, etc. Um, they, they just want an answer, really. And most people will actually just say, I don't really care what you do with it. If you want to post it, then that's great. Other people say, yeah, you can post it, but I don't want my name forward on, on anything to do with it. I just wanted to know what I'd seen. Um, so, yeah, I just want to help people out in that respect. So, Because mm-hmm. I, just, I just see traits of way back when I started in ufology and – there was nobody really to turn to then to, to actually, you, you had to pick a book up, you had to read and go alive, go to a library and the internet started to come out and you know how slow the internet was when it first came out with the old modem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And things, but you know, things progress and now you do everything on your phone. It's, it's, it's amazing. And we can all, uh, you know, I generally find if I go to a conference or somewhere and I go and watch a speaker, somebody will approach me with a story or we saw this years ago or they want an ex- explanation of what they've seen. And I'll, t- I'll try, you know, help them the best I can. Um, I know this uh, particular case does not have any photos involved, but I wanted to know if you followed it because it's actually – one of my favorite cases in the UK, and that's the Alderney, the uh, Channel Crossing uh, oh, UFO yeah. case. Did Jer- you follow? Is that the Jersey with the pilot? Right. Did you? Yeah, have you? Um, I mean, that's that's actually one of my favorite cases because of the craft itself is just so bizarre. This big yellow, huge yellow thing, and the passengers, yeah. everyone saw it, and you know, and the a, pilot being yeah. really credible witness. Right. Um, and the um, it, I, I can remember when I was younger, and it actually being on the UK television. It was on the we have a, a morning TV show over here called This Morning. Mm-hmm. Where, um, we have the BBC, and we're obviously going way back, we only had th- three or four channels. Not like in 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 America, we have all the cable channels, and so you either watch the BBC or ITV or. But this this show was called This Morning on on the ITV network, and I can remember the pilot being interviewed on it and uh, and give, giving out what he'd seen, and you know it couldn't explain what he'd seen, and it's pretty amazing at the time with the pilot actually coming forward and you know saying what he'd seen and his, his experience because when pilots do come forward, they they got the risk of losing their job. That's exactly right, and it has happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I hope that I think that will loosen up a little more, um, you know, especially in the United States after the Pentagon, you know, released actually information that they've been, you know, at least studying them for possible threat. Yeah. You know, well, the gun, the gun footage from uh, to the Stars Academy is it with Tom yeah. DeLong? And, yeah, but the yeah. only thing when that footage has come out um i remember seeing one of those i think there's three videos up to now isn't there that have been out yeah well um there's the gimbal there's the nemets and then there's uh, the recent one yeah um one of them i can remember being available 10 years plus ago and seeing yes. it at the time that was the third one because yeah. i had a i had a pilot um, actually talked to me that he actually remembers seeing that in a briefing. And mm-hmm. it was a really good case of a catch uh, of how the uh, the camera caught the object and was able to track it once yeah. it caught it. It was and, good uh, training. But yeah. also, I mean, I, I did bring this up a while ago when the footage was being released. Um, whether, whether it's right or wrong, whether you believe they're doing it the right way for disclosure, etc. And I do understand the, the chain of, uh, you know, where they bring uh, these things out. They've got to be done in a certain way. And But um, actually on the head-up display, on the, the right-hand side, you can see the word slave that is wrote down on the side of the right-hand side of the screen. Um it's just um, a military term that I can remember, and another word for slave is drone. Ah. Uh, and I don't know. I'm still 
I'm like everybody else. I, I I watch everything. I watch endless hours of YouTube and everything to do with ufology. I look at the good, the bad, the ugly. I watch everything. Um, and I can remember when it came out, and that was the first thing I saw, Slave, and the first thing that came to my mind, Drone. Now, are they taking photographs? Are they taking footage of drones? And I'm talking advanced drones, not, you know, the, the type of things we see flying around and you can buy yourself um, yeah. way advanced. So it, that that was just a little alarm bell for me. But, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Actually, I will get a question. I will get that question to Elizondo, um, mm. who, um, you know, represented the. Uh, you know the program. I will get that yeah. question to him and find out what he has to say. That'd be interesting. Yeah, um, and I will. I will let you know because uh, mm. I, I would like to know because actually, after I heard that that video was seen in training, you know, in a debriefing or or briefing, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought, wow. So this is not such a big. This particular video is not such a big deal, basically. No. No, and and also the footage, when it starts to come out more and more, which they're saying they've got really good footage that's going to be coming out. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna have to start coming out better. Be only the fact that some of the footage we've seen now, it's not something you really sit up and go, oh, you do you wonder what the craft is, but you also when they say they're tracking UFOs and et cetera, you would expect it to be of a higher quality and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think they've got to start stepping it up a bit. If well, I know there's a, there's a possible... Uh, the, I heard initially, um, and it may have been through George Knapp, that there was actually 12 videos in total that mm. could be available, but I don't know if that's actually... I don't have any confirmation of that. And I also have been speaking with, um, uh, communicating with Ralph Blumenthal. He was one of the co-authors of that uh, New York Times article along with Leslie Kane, and I forget the yeah. other um, author. Um, he says there's more coming out, and stay tuned. Mm. <laughs> you know, so I think like every few months we're going to get a little bit of this and that, basically to mm. kind of keep the story alive, and which I think is a good thing, because uh, yeah. I think you know people will take it more seriously overall i also think the footage that has been released it's not made the impact they probably thought it would do um more the fact people are being a bit, bit blasé about it really when the footage is out and they're just waiting for the next footage to come out the next piece of information and that's like old hat now um and like you said the possibly 12 maybe more uh, clips that are going to come out. The only the only other criticism really I've got with it, they give you the the snippets of footage they want you to see. They don't give you the overall where they they first come in contact with the object and also where they lose the con the the object. So I think if they could give a bigger clip to everybody um, in ufology, especially, um, it would be better. Now, from what I understand, they are giving what is unclassified. In other words, there are parts of the film that is still classified that they're not going to release. That's what mm -hmm. I that's what I've understood understood through Alejandro Rojas, who helps out with the show. Um, that's what he found out. So this is like secondhand uh, uh, through him. But yeah. from what I understand, some of it is just plain classified and can't be released. Why not. that is? Uh, why would it be? <laughs> I mean, that that's uh, is there. Yeah. I mean, there could be some reasons that I just can't think of. The reason it's still classified, but you know, no. maybe it shows some type of military uh, um, technology or something that they don't want to release. Oh, or was one of the craft shot down, or was one of the <laughs> aircraft shot down? <laughs> yeah, or shot at. Yeah, yeah. Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are open for calls if anyone wants to give a call. Uh, meanwhile. And let's uh, let's talk about some other cases in the book. You've mentioned the ones that are your your favorite. Um, 
how about ones that are there any like really bizarre ones that you can think of? Um, I really um, like the weird stories myself. <laughs> There's the, um, the the famous one, but the the late late latest sort of famous. Uh, case released again. I got through Philip Mantle originally was the the China Lake UFO. Yes, but it was the metallic disc that was shown over the the desert scenery, you know. And you've got the helicopter in in shot as well. That that uh, that that was one of those too good to be true ones, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but then, is that like the million dollar? photograph that you want you know you want the the, the more military whether it's a, a back engineered craft and the person that took the, the photographs of it um just basically took it of a, a, a re-engineered ufo craft whatever you want to come up with you know, in relation to how it got there but the good thing about it was more the fact that the um you can see on um, yeah move it over oh, to the other way there you go yeah yeah you can see the the disc obviously there yeah and it's it's quite good because the there's about six separate photographs they've also got the the cloud the the, the scenery and i've actually overlaid different you can see the helicopter in the shot there yeah and so, you know, there's quite a few. They're, they're the original photographs, and then I've actually overlaid um, two of the photographs in the, within the book. The right way. There, you can see that's two of uh, two separate photographs overlaid yep. to mm -hmm. each other, which prove that the object has moved further away and has also moved in relation to the other photograph so and then also one that you with the analyze you can see the reflection of the desert underneath the metallic craft and if you go off what the witnesses said um you know where the base it was a test base so things would have been tested there um it, it was one of those intriguing cases really now did you cooperate with anyone you know work with anyone in any of these you know contact someone that was uh, working on it or anything like that no no the the case i got were all through philip and then um obviously i wrote initially i actually wrote a piece for the um outer limits magazine mm -hmm. which is in the uk um and did a proper analysis of of the the photographs and then a write-up of it and what i actually thought um and my findings, and then we took the details here of what the the person has actually wrote himself, um, and put that into the book with the analysis of the photographs. And I just thought it was a really good one to to put in the book to show people, you know, you can get a decent quality photograph. I mean, also you could you could you could also go back and say with Billy Meyer uh, with his photographs how good they were. I mean, people do say he's fake. He, he's produced fake photographs. Um, I personally think they're real. And later on, at some point, I will do a, a real in-depth analysis of the photographs. I've already done a couple of videos and, and things, etc. Um, I did actually do one photograph, uh, an obscure photograph, not one of his more known, where it was taken where where he go out and actually see the craft or have his um experiences uh with the beam ship etc the military used to uh, actually buzz the ufo now whether they picked it up on you on radar etc i don't know um but you can see the outline of the military aircraft so i did an analysis of that photograph and it was a, I think it was a Saab or a, um, the, the actual military aircraft used at the time. And I actually identified the military aircraft as being a positive ID of the, the type used of that time period. And, you know, it would it flown directly over the, the disc shaped craft in, in the shot. I personally, 
I'm going to have to disagree with you on Billy Meyer. I'm sorry yeah. to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I personally think that, um, you know, maybe he did have an experience. I, I would say that he probably may have had some type of real experience. But there's been so many cases where, you know, they've found the fishing line on the one that, you know, moves back and forth. Um, mm. There's also, uh, uh, I forget what they call it, like a bon bonsai tree. Um, oh, the, yeah, the miniature tree, yeah. The miniature yeah. tree. Um, then there's the garbage can lids um, yeah. that, you know, there's there's so many. To me, if if someone's going to, if someone fakes one single craft, I don't trust any of them. I mean, that's just the way I am. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm an appraiser for art, fine art, and it's like if I find a fake painting in a house, I don't trust all the other paintings, you know, <laughs> yeah. so I can't help it. So, yeah. But anyway, um, I just hope it's not a futile uh, experience for you to do all that work for uh, going no, nowhere. No, no I, I'll do. Um, really, it's a lot of it is, is again, for myself, really, because I, I want to know if it's real or not, just like everybody else does. Um, and I do say, and I've said it numerous times, there are no experts in ufology. We're all trying to find the answers, the truth of yeah. whatever, whether somebody's had an experience himself or not, you know, it, it's so be it. But I don't find any research as being futile and, and trying to find because – you know, you, you get into the truth, really, or oh, I think I'm trying to get to the truth. And then, um, you know, it, some photographs I will analyse, I will take a long time and a lot of um, my time to uh, to analyse them and then find at the end that they just tail off and it, they don't really give you anything back. And you, you do find that it's not necessarily a fake, but there's something else explain to the photograph I and mean, when i did one the other night i don't know if the guy wants to give his name so i won't say his name and it was a location in in the states and he sent me a couple of images of it basically it looked like a boomerang shaped object in the distance and he said he was driving in his truck along um and took the images consecutively out of the side um, window of his truck of this object in the distance. And it, it's moved. You can see it moved at different locations over the different photographs. When I analysed the footage in more detail, you could see actually on the leading edge of the boomerang shape to it, the more you got into the object itself and enhanced that um, the object. First of all, I upscaled the photograph, which brought the detail up, and then I'll go in and analyze the photograph. But when I actually looked at it, you could see a staggered edge to the leading edge of the wings. Um, so I obviously went into the internet and had a good look at um, stealth aircraft and the B B2 bomber, I think it was. Um, when I actually put them side by side, that that's obviously what it was. Wow. Um, so I, I sent it back to him. And again, if it's stealth and it's a distance away from where he took the photograph, you're not going to hear the engine sounds. You're not going to hear. I mean, I don't know if anybody else has ever been to an air show where yeah. they go and see military aircraft. And generally when the aircraft is, the first thing you know of the aircraft passing you is is that you'll see the aircraft fly over your head and then you hear the roar of the engine right. afterwards. Yeah. So anything from a distance, you're not going to probably hear anything. So you can rule that out as such. But he was quite okay when I told him what I thought it was. He wasn't, you know, you know he sort of took it on the chin and said, well, at least I know what it is now. And, yeah. you know, you know, so I do get an awful lot of photographs and I do get to the bottom of a lot of them and a lot of them are actually birds or unidentified. So again, it's whether it's what that person wants to hear. You know, some people wanna want want to hear that they've seen a UFO and, and that's the end of it. So Yeah, that's true. And you can't mm. convince them otherwise. That's good. Yeah. I'm glad that guy had that reaction and it's good mm. to hear it's actually good to hear that. 
Um, you know, it's funny. I was contacted by the um, History Channel a few, about three weeks ago, and they said they wanted to know if I knew any quote unquote UFO experts <laughs> in the New York City area. Area. So uh, I uh, wrote them back. I said, "Give me a call." And so the woman, you know, the, the casting agent called me. Mm. Uh, I actually gave her Lee Spiegel's name, and I hope hope he's up. They're going to be filming this week, actually. Uh, oh, weekend. Right. But anyway, yeah. I said, here's someone that knows about UFOs, but please, you know, know this is no such thing as a UFO expert. You know I mean, <laughs> and uh, no, that, she was good no. about it, though. No. Um, um. So uh, we have we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, we can take calls for another five minutes if anyone else wants to give us a ring here. Um, I'll try to look at the uh, chat room if there's any questions that uh, someone wants to post on there for our guest instead of calling in. Go right ahead and do that. Um, as far as uh, other historic photos, I know um, you said you did one about every 10 years. Were there some like second place ones that you really wanted to put in this book that you looked into and you had to make a decision yeah there was um quite a few um i i wanted to really put other experiences because things have not just happened to me my, my father's had experience as well he's ex-military um and he had um basically it was a, a man in black who actually appeared and walked through his front door when he was a young child um, and again, he only really told me about it when I started getting into ufology and, and talking about these type of things. And obviously, men in black come up a lot. Um, and it, I've actually done an illustration. I wanted to put stuff like that in the book, but it was more difficult because this book was going to be more of a layman termed DIY UFO book, if you know what I mean. So... I might put them in the next book, but the the uh, the account that happened to him, he was playing as a young child in in this house in Liverpool again, um, and my relatives were in the other room, and this was before television, so they had a radio playing in the front room, and he'd be playing in the hallway, and he said he got to the hallway, looked up towards the front door, um, and he said as he looked up. He said a, a tall, dark stranger walked through the front door and stood in front of him. Um, obviously, he panicked and ran back into the front room away to tell my relatives what had happened. And they just poo-pooed it and said, no, no, that didn't happen. And you know, for, when he went back and peered through the door, he said the um, tall, dark stranger, whatever it was, beckon to him to walk up the stairs and follow him up the stairs where he went up and that was the end of it. And when over the couple of years I've tried to talk to my father more about it and bring out, you know, more detail so I could do an illustration. Um, and it, it was basically that the guy was working, wearing a dark suit with a, a tie and a white shirt and, a, and a, like a trilby hat. So it, it, all the hallmarks of uh, men in black. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, that's... Yeah. I think I did a show partly on that, uh, maybe with uh, Nick Redfern, I believe. But, uh, mm. yeah, there's some there's some uh, strange encounters. Uh, um, you know, I mean, it, at first, you know, when I first heard Men in Black, I'm thinking, oh, the movie. But then I didn't realize the movie was made after, you know, the, the accounts of men in, in black. Yeah. Um, and uh, but one of the stories, I mean, they had some bizarre stories. They showing up in these old vintage cars and uh, mm. one like had a car in a cornfield that disappeared. Did you ever hear? I mean, there's so many bizarre stories when it comes to the men. In there's, black. Yeah. And, and the um, the children with black eyes. And oh, yeah. Pete. People have said they've knocked on the door and they, they wouldn't open the door to it. And all to do with experiences and people have told me things as well in confidence. Um, and that there's other things that have happened to me. I wanted to put another in, um, uh, experience that happened to myself in the Air Force when um, I used to be stationed on a nuclear base. 
mm-hmm. in the UK. And part, long story short, everybody who went on the base had to do this guard duty, which is a, a rapid response team. So you would be called out any time of day or night to an incident that happened. Um, and during those couple of weeks you did this duty, um, you would have a, a training drill where you'd be called out day or night. You don't know when it's going to be. You get the sirens and everything, and you'd all get into four ton of trucks and all be driving up to the silos where the, the, the missiles and et cetera and ordnance were kept. And they, they, they were all typical what you'd expect it to be with the, the, the large fences around and the towers with the armed guards in. But the, it's just exactly like that. And as you go into the – you're all coming off the truck, so you're all put into like a, a squadron ready to go in. Um, as you go into the, the different separate gates as you get deeper into the compounds – um, you were all tagged in, so you're given a tag to go in there. And then when you all come out, you're tagged out and you give the tag back and everybody knows who's in, who's out, and it's all quite simple. But I can remember us all going into this compound. I remember us all coming out of the compound, and as we came out, we had an extra guy with us, and none of us knew who this person was. Oh, um, and he was pinned to the ground with all the rifles, et cetera, put to his head and we were all whisked off. And I was young and stupid at the time and I never thought anything else of it. And <laughs> it's just a, another weird thing that happened, you know? Right. Uh, we only have like two minutes left, but I question that I, always comes up when I talk to people from a different country, or a lot of times it does anyway, is uh, what is the situation with the so-called experiencers, ab- abductees, in the UK, as far as you know, uh, it's very active in the United States, and I just wondered what it was like there. Do you know? Um, as, as in people contacting or places as in, they could. As in people that are claiming they're they're getting abducted. Oh, it's always been quite high. Um, Has it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get a lot of people from all over the world who contact me regarding it. You know, um, the Greys, etc. You know, and and. You know, it. I just think it, it, it's quite a big, whether it's a problem or not, but um, there's an awful lot of people out there that, that come forward um, and a lot of people don't want, want their names, you know, obviously bringing up or related to it because, you know, you, people will think they're, uh, they're weird or, you know, yeah. they're, they're nuts and... Yeah. Uh, and it, the, the stigma is still there, but if you've got somebody you can talk to or I can put it, generally if somebody will contact me with that sort of a problem, I'm no expert. I'm not a professional person who can help them in those problems. So I can, I can point them in the right direction, which is probably more than they, than they had before. They, they didn't know who to turn to, where to turn to. But if they could go and speak to somebody else who's been in the same boat or had the same experiences, then I feel like I've helped them out in that respect. I'm sure you have. Well, thank you so much. And uh, that was a, a real good night. I enjoyed speaking to you very much. Right, yeah. And good luck with your next book, too, whenever you decide to do that. Yeah, All right. right. All right. Well, you take care. Thank you now. All right. Have a good night. Bye now. Bye. All right, everyone. So that's it for uh, that's it for the show. And remember, if you're a YouTube uh, listener, watcher, whatever, I will be simulcasting something on this Sunday night uh, at around nine nine p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So check that out if you'd like. Next week, we're going to be here with uh, Jane Kyle, and Jane is. Uh, is uh, Texas, she's involved in Texas UFOs. So uh, that should be good uh, and enjoyable. And I that's the first time I'll have her on the show. And I want to thank you if you're listening to this and you support the show. Thanks for listening over um, on the Dark Matter Digital Network as well. Also, I want to thank our guest, of course, uh, Jason Gleaves, 
Um, I want to thank Evan for helping us out with the show work, live show work, and Peggy for helping with the Facebook page. And that's it, everyone. Thanks so much. Remember to keep your eyes to the sky. Thank you.